right, church, turn with me to Romans 2, Romans 2, 25 through 29. We are finishing finally the chapter 2 of Romans this morning. And this morning we have some bridges to cross. Uh, we always have the cultural bridge from the New Testament and, um, and the Old Testament, and there's the culture of the time and, and, and understanding what the text is saying in that culture, but then also bridging the Old Covenant uh, this morning. We're getting back into the Old Covenant. We're, of course, New Covenant believers uh, by the blood of Christ, as Jesus said. You know, this is my blood which is from the new covenant. So we are new covenant believers, but so we're going to get into the old covenant today. And so we've got that bridge to cross. And so we need the Lord uh, to help us this morning. Let's go to him in prayer before we dig into the word. Father, we do long to lift your name up high. And Lord, I pray that as we get into your word this morning, Lord, that you would be glorified. Lord, teach us, teach us more of yourself. Teach us how to be wholly devoted to you. Teach us how to rest in the relationship with you. Lord, transform our hearts, our affections, our will, our mind, so that we may live the victorious Christian life that you've called us to live and that our souls will be strong. Lord, that we may walk out and live out the salvation that you have given to us as a free gift. In your name, amen. So chapter 2, verse 25 through 29, just a little context, just to remind us what's going on here. Paul is, of course, explaining the gospel in depth. And he starts out by talking about the wrath of God being revealed in heaven against all ungodliness, all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. And then he talks about a society that spins out of control. And he gives us an example of that in Romans 1, where the society is spinning out of control in this downward spiral um, into this utter just rebellion towards God and approving of even people who do evil. That it's that it's okay and good and cheering people on. And then he, then he goes into really a, a speaking specific to people groups because let's face it, sometimes when we read the Bible, we tend to go, oh yeah, those people need to hear it over there, don't they? We tend to go, oh yeah, yeah, that, that's talking about those crazy people over there. And he just brings it down and meticulously, surgically wrecks every single type of person, and he talks about the Gentiles, and he talks about the Jews, and he talks about the teachers of the law, and now he's talking about those who are religious and have all of these religious uh, memories of their past, maybe their resume. I've had this. I've done this. Paul had a resume. He said, I was circumcised on this day, and uh, I'm a Jew amongst Jews, a Pharisee amongst Pharisees, and so then he's speaking to that type of person. And and so let us dig into the text, starting verse 25. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have written have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit not by the letter, his praise is not from man, but from God. So just a little context here. Church is growing like crazy. The the, the tomb is empty. Christ is risen. Gentiles are coming to know Christ in droves. Jews are coming to know Christ 
But the nation of, of the, the Jewish nation, the nation of Israel is largely rejecting, largely rejecting, mainly, I believe, because of the leaders of the time and the hold that they had on those people. But Jews are coming to know Christ. And as the Jews are coming to know Christ, they're saying, wait a minute, circumcision has always been a big part of our faith. In fact, we all have to be circumcised. And now you're saying, and if you read through Acts, you can see this, that we don't have to be circumcised. Like that's not that big of a deal. Think of the guy who maybe just got circumcised a couple of weeks ago because adults did get circumcised. And especially those who maybe the Gentiles who wanted to become they, a Jew and they were like, you know, they're so pure and they were tired of paganism. And so they're like, I'm going to become a Jew. I'm going to start following Yahweh. And so they had to get circumcised. Can you imagine that guy who just had, was circumcised maybe a couple of weeks before and he's going, well, it didn't matter. He just finds this out or the, the family that pays for their kids, their boys to be circumcised. And now they're having to deal with this child cleaning and making sure that the wound heals. And think about that. Like that is what's going on. And that was such an important thing for the old covenant believer. And so they're struggling with why that doesn't matter anymore. And what does this mean now? He's also talking to the person who their identity was fully, fully formed in what they have done. The, the works that they have done. I, you know, I have, I have been circumcised. I, 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 I go to the synagogue. I, I worship God consistently. And so that is my identity. So really this text church is an identity text. It is, it is a text that speaks of who you are and who we are. Okay. Who we are and how Christ has changed our life. And what does that mean for us today? Martin Luther a great theologian of the Reformation, about five to 600 years ago, was a monk before he came to know Christ as his Savior. Now, he didn't even know Christ as his Savior as a monk. He studied the Bible, and he, he did all of these things to try to convince himself that he was accepted by God. In fact, he, he would sleep on a hard floor with no soft bed. He would eat the dullest food that you possibly could eat. Why? Because he knew that the flesh was dangerous and he wanted to crucify the flesh and then convince himself that he was safe spiritually and nothing worked and he was miserable and he was fearful. He couldn't get rid of that fleshly desire in him to want things that he knew he shouldn't want. And so even though he went to the nth degree to try to deal with the flesh, he could not, could not fix the problem. And then one night, late at night, as he was studying Romans, he was studying Romans and he saw that Romans teaches the righteousness of God apart from works of the law, is a free gift through salvation in Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ and what Christ has done, and that it is a free gift given by God. And he says this, it's as if the very gates of heaven had opened for me. As he finally saw the amazing grace and love of God in the gospel, and it broke him into this joyful repentance and turning to Christ for his salvation and not to his own works. And that is what Paul is talking about here. You who are trying to keep your identity in the works of the law, don't you realize that the works of the law were really meant to bring you to God in brokenness with a contrite heart, a humble heart, of relying on what God has done for you. That is what 
circumcision is all about, is what he's saying here. The key verse in this is verse 29, but a Jew is one inwardly. Circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. I was, uh, when I was a youth pastor, there was a girl in my youth group, many of you guys know a lot of the story. Um, She got cancer, it was osteosarcoma in her leg, in her femur, and um, and it, it just spread throughout her body. And over a two-year, maybe less than two-year period, it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And um, I'll never forget her sharing her testimony and saying, through tears, to um, the homeless mission in our, in our community, she said, now, doctors told me just a month ago that, Robin, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do for you. You're, you're going to die. And I'll never forget her saying that. When I heard the news, we were, she was in Seattle at the hospital. We were as a youth group in Seattle for an event called Creation Fest. It was a music festival and there was a lot of great speakers and we were there for that. And she decided she wanted to join us. Once she got that news, she decided, I'm tired of hospitals. I just want to be with my friends. I want to go to Creation Fest. So she came straight from the hospital to Creation Fest. And I remember thinking, Lord, help me to somehow pastor her and shepherd her through this. What do I say? What do I do? I, did ha- I had no idea. I just said, Lord, open up a door. And I was walking uh, through the, the grounds at Creation Fest, and I saw her and her best friend sitting at a picnic table, uh, just them, and I'm like, I'm going to go sit and talk to him. So I came over, sat and talked to him. How are you guys doing? They just were, you know, they were, seemed normal. They were just asking me about youth group and catch him. They wanted me to catch him up on all the things going on. And then Robin asked the question of all questions. She said, how do I know that I'm going to go to heaven? Did I say, Robin, how many times have you gone to church? Did I say, Robin, have you been baptized? Have you not been baptized? Sorry, that's a quote from Nacho Libre, if anybody doesn't know that movie. You know, in that movie, he, he, the reason why that's in that movie is him being Catholic and a lot about tradition. That was a big deal. Like, you haven't been, I'm worried about your salvation. You've been baptized. Did I ask her that? No. Did I ask her, how often do you read your Bible, Robin? No. Well, those are all important things. And those are all part of life as a believer and following Christ and wanting to know about him and wanting to grow in your faith. That is not where salvation comes from because that is by works. If it is to be this, this, or this. I said, Robin, God is after your heart. He is after your heart. My only question for you is this. Have you repented of your sin and have you trusted in Jesus to save you from all of your sins? And she said, yes. I said, Robin, then you don't have to question at all. Jesus has died. All of your sins are paid for. It is finished and you have a relationship with him and nothing can take that away. Nothing. And she then talked to her mom after that. And her mom ended up texting me and saying, thank you so much for talking to my daughter. It meant so much to her and has really helped her. And I thought that isn't me. That's just knowing the gospel and giving her truth, giving her what the Bible says. God is after your heart, church. Do you know that? God longs to have a relationship with you. In the Old Testament, it says that he's jealous. Remember uh, Tommy reading in his Bible one time, he's like, why does it say God is jealous? It's a good question. I said, because God has this covenant relationship with his people. And when his people go after other idols and go after other gods, he longs for a relationship just like a husband would for his wife, for his bride. If his wife is starts to cheat on him with somebody, there is a righteous type of jealousy there. 
And that is how God is for us. He has this relationship with us through Christ and the paying for our sins and the circumcision is just a representation of what was to come with Christ. Let's go back a little bit, cross the, the covenantal bridge to the Old Testament. And let's talk a little bit about circumcision because he talks a lot about that here. I think we kind of go, what's the big deal with circumcision? Well, you know, like American culture, we're like, why, why do we, why does he talk about circumcision so much? Ugh, I don't even want to think about that, right? Circumcision represented in the Old Testament a separation from the pagan nations around them. It was a, a cutting off. It symbolized sin being cut off. It symbolized their purity as a nation. And so when a father was circumcised, it was, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so it was a patriarchal society, of course, we know that. And as the father of the house decides, I'm, I'm following Yahweh, I'm going to be circumcised and my sons are going to be circumcised and this is who we are. It was a representation of who they are, that they are a people set apart. You see, God, after the, the fall, after, after sin entered into the world and the world became so broken and immediately you see murder and you see treachery and you see rape and you see all kinds of problems as you read through the Old Testament and Genesis, right away, God's plan was to preserve a people that would bring about the Messiah to save the world. This goes all the way back to Abraham. This is clearly seen throughout the Old Testament. And as God's perfect plan, at the perfect appointed time in history, Jesus would come to redeem the world. That is God's plan. And circumcision was a, 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 the, the symbol that showed the world what Israel was, and it was, it was to show them who they were. That's what it represented. Now, it was an act that involved a seriousness of faith. I mean, you're not going to just go do that on a whim, right? Like, you have to be serious about your faith. And the father of a home had to be serious about what he was going to be teaching to his kids. And so this was an act that showed the severity of his commitment. Now, how does this relate to us? Church, baptism replaces circumcision. You can turn to Colossians 2, if you'd like, Colossians 2, 12 through 15. And this explains this explicitly here, okay? Colossians 2, 12 through 15. It says this, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, there's that, that deadness, that sin, the uncircumcision of your flesh. That's what circumcision represented, the, the cut, that sin needed to be cut off. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. I love that text. That'd be a good cross reference, by the way, to write in your Bible on that Romans passage when it's talking about circumcision, because this is how it relates to us. And it's very, very similar to circumcision. It is a cutting off of sin, legally separating us from the consequences of our sin when we repent of our sin and trust in Christ. That God legally counts us as righteous. That is what Martin Luther finally found through all of his journey and all of his religious, you know, ceremonial workings that he, that he participated in and all of the areas of Catholicism, all that he did, he was searching. He was searching for salvation. He was searching for God to look at him as righteous. And when he found that the righteousness of God is a gift through Christ. When he found that, that's when he was freed. 
That's when he said it was like heaven opened up for me. And I saw the goodness and the glory and the mercy and the grace of God. And that's what Colossians 2 is saying. And so baptism represents that for us. It is full identity. It is a heart miraculous thing that God has done and, and, and covering all of our sins and burying us with Christ. So it says buried with him in baptism. It says in Colossians 2, buried with him in baptism, okay? And all of our sins are buried at the cross, all of it. And then we are raised in this new life that we have, alive spiritually, that as you accept Christ as your savior, it is not me getting everything figured out right in my mind, theology and all that. You know, we want that, we want to seek that, but that's not the answer. It is a miraculous thing that happens when someone, a sinner, falls at the feet of Jesus and says, have mercy on me, O God, a sinner. That's what baptism represents. Now, some things that I think are important to comment on here. Why, my question is, why is this such, like, such a big change? Like, why don't we still be circumcised? Why baptism now? I I don't think it's explicit in the scriptures as to why God does this, but we can, we can, we can notice a couple things and observe a couple things. One is Luke uh, 12, 52 through 53. If you think about the nation of Israel, and how following Yahweh, it was an entire family, the father was circumcised, and it asked for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? Well, he preserves these people, Messiah comes, although circumcision is a matter of a heart, it's always been that, God doesn't change, he's the same yesterday, and today, and tomorrow, so all throughout, it's about God, God having the heart of his people, That's what it's always been about. It's always about the humility of people saying, God, save me from myself and I want to follow you and I want to to, uh, honor you with my life. But then when Christianity grew or was growing and Christ, Christ had risen from the dead, what did he say to his disciples? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. So now it is to go to every tribe and tongue and nation that was prophesied about from the beginning in heaven, every tribe, tongue, and nation is going to be represented in heaven. And so as you do that, you're going to have mothers who accept Christ and fathers who don't. You're going to have kids who accept Christ and parents who don't. And that's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 52 through 53, he explained this to his disciples. He said, for from now on, In one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Now, is that God's explicit will that he wants to just cause chaos in families? No, but he knows that when the gospel is going forth into all the world, people have to choose whom this day they will serve. People have to choose. Each person has to make a decision. Do I believe in Christ? And that's why when sometimes when a, uh, there's accounts in the early church, how when a woman came to know Christ, her husband was still pagan and would go and have, you know, worship pagan gods at the Roman temples and have orgies because that's how you worship. And the wife is going, I don't know what to do now. And Paul deals with that in 1 Corinthians because she's like, I, 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 do I stay married to the man? It was a constant issue in the early church. So baptism is the thing now because it is between each person and their relationship with God. That child has to make a decision to accept Christ as a savior before he's baptized. Before he's baptized, this is not not just a a family thing where it's a nation thing. This is an individual decision. And that's why we see in the New Testament, every time somebody was baptized, every time they first repented of their sin and then they were baptized. So this is not a salvation issue. Baptism does not save you. 
Water baptism doesn't save you. Spiritual baptism does. As described in Colossians 2, where the Holy Spirit enters into us when we repent of our sin and he cleanses us from all of our sin. That is being baptized into the spirit of God. Water baptism is a representation of that and it is a work that we do in obedience to Christ. And if we ever make that a salvation issue, we just add it to the cross and we take away from what Christ has done. And sadly, that has happened in Christianity. You see how we have, we have twisted things just like the Jewish people were doing with circumcision? The same exact thing. Paul is like, listen, those who are uncircumcised are following the law. Look at these Gentiles coming into faith in Christ. Their uncircumcision is circumcision because it's a matter of the heart. And it's the same exact thing with baptism. The same exact thing. And so, just as circumcision does not save, as Paul makes explicitly clear here, so baptism also does not save. It is simply a matter of obedience to the Lord. Now, church, this doesn't mean that baptism doesn't matter. Just like circumcision in the Old Testament did, uh, mattered as well. Both matter, and Paul makes that clear right at the beginning of this. He says, for circumcision indeed is a value. It's a value as long as you get the whole point, as long as you don't get it twisted, as long as you don't make this work be your identity. Rather, it is a circumcision of the heart. So I want to get into the heart a little bit here because for most of my Christian life, I, I was very confused about the heart until just of recent when I read a book about idols of the heart. And in this book, she explains what is the heart and what, do we, what does the Bible say about the heart? Because this is very, very important. We've got to get this. We've got to get this. What does he mean by it being of the heart? The heart in scripture is described as three elements. Three elements we see in scripture. The mind the affections and the will. Mind, affections, and will. And this is so important to understand this is all connected. Notice the arrows going from mind to affections, affections to will, will to mind. They all affect each other. And and so if you you focus on your mind, if you you like meditate on the words of God cognitively with your mind, using your thoughts and your understanding and your discernment and your beliefs, then your mind starts to be transformed and you start to want what is good. Want what is good. There's a couple texts there. Matthew chapter 13, verse 15, and Romans 1 through, or 121 are good texts that explain how the, the uh, heart is the mind. You think with your heart. If you think with your heart, then obviously the heart is the mind. So the heart is the mind. That's part of us. And and so we, we, we want to, God wants all of that. He wants all of our mind and our thoughts and our discernments and understanding. And he's transforming that in us as believers. So then our mind affects our affections, our longings, our desires, our feelings, our emotions. And there is uh, some texts there for you that you could write down if you like. Deuteronomy 28, 47, Isaiah 35, 4, James 3, 14. This really is kind of like a systematic theology of the heart. What is the heart? What does the Bible say is the heart? Not just one verse, but a systematic approach to taking all of these texts and bringing it in and saying, what does the Bible say about the heart? So when God says that circumcision of, of the heart, what does he mean by that? This is what he means. This is really all of who we are, all of our our longings, our desires, our thoughts, our, our choices. And next is the choice. So then you have affections. And if you want something, if you desire something, what do you do? You choose to do it. You choose to do it. So you see how the affections affect our will and the will affects the mind. So the will is our choice or our action. Psalm uh, 25 verse 12 in Isaiah 7, 15. Again, church, God is after your heart. Church, do you ever wonder at times, what do you do when you just don't want to do what God has 
calling you to do. You know, devotions just in the morning, you know, I really want to get a better devotional life. Like, but man, I just have a hard time waking up. Or I really should go to church more. But you know, I just, that game and, you know, the weekend's just so nice. I think I want to just do my own thing, right? Or, you know, like, I really want to, want to stop doing this one sin in my life, this addiction that I have, whatever it may be. I I, I struggle with this this addiction. It pulls me down and I I got to stop this. And I want to long for what is good and true and pure. What do you do when you want that? And yet you just don't want it. You know what I'm talking about? Like you, you know, you should do it. You know, it's right, but you don't really want it. You want this still. How do you deal with that? Let me give you a, a, just a, 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 an example, an illustration that's pr- probably not, not as good as it, as it could be, but it, it'll help, I think. So um, how ma- I don't know how many of you guys, how many of you guys like Pepsi or Coke? All right, yeah, a good amount of you guys. And Travis back there loves his Pepsi. Right? So Pepsi has a lot of sugar. Coke has a lot of sugar. I have a friend in Spokane that he drank diet Pepsi. And he told me, he's like, yeah, I used to drink Pepsi a lot. And I switched over to diet. I'm like, how did you do that? I was like, cause I, I just, I taste diet, diet. I'm like, ugh, it's just gross. He says, well, I, well, I knew that people love their diet. He's like, so I knew that they had somehow acquired a taste for that. So what what I decided was I was going to start making steps towards changing my desires, okay? And he said, the reason why was because my doctor told me I was pre-diabetic. He's like, you got to stop drinking the sugar, man. That's your worst. You're drinking all this sugar. He's like, you're pre-diabetic. You've got to stop. And he said, I never really had a motivation until that day. And then I had this strong motivation because I knew enough about diabetes that I didn't want that. And so he said, I started to have like, what I did was I just put a fourth diet with three fourths regular and then half diet with half regular. And I just slowly switched over. And now I love diet. And And it makes me think of like coffee is the same way. I had some coffee this morning because Caitlin woke me up at 4 a.m. And she has these, um, you know, like times where she just wake up at night and scream or say something crazy. Like the other, the other night it was, I want two, I want two. And I was like, she kept saying it. I said, Caitlin, okay, we'll give you two. You know, just trying to go back to sleep. Right. So she woke me up. Heidi was up till, uh, past midnight helping one of our kids with their schooling. So I didn't get much sleep. So I had to have coffee. I came in the office and there, and I, I made coffee and I had it just straight black coffee and the breaker flipped back there. So I got like the bitterest part, you know, it hadn't all the way gone through. It was just the beginning. And it's really, really intense. And I'm like, man, that was good. Kind of like that. That's because I've, I've slowly, I still like sugar, but I've slowly acquired the taste for um, coffee without sugar. I used to just hate that. And it's interesting how when we make the right choices, when we decide in our mind, when we make choices, how our desires follow. And that is how it is with our heart. Okay, if you want to worship God or love God with all your heart, trust his diagnosis. Church, trust his diagnosis, okay? That's the big one because I really believe in spirituality with our spiritual life. It's just like our physical life. We're gonna keep drinking the Pepsi until our doctor says, dude, you gotta stop, man. Like you're gonna die. I have eaten less sugar in the last month than I have in my entire life because my cousin just dropped dead like that at 43 and he ate a lot of sugar. And I don't know all the reasons why, but it woke me up. I'm like, man, I, I got to cut this out. And it's like that with our spiritual walk. We can keep playing around with sin and thinking it's okay and just having these, all these idols in our life. 
and, and these things that come in the way of God. And that's what Paul's saying. He's saying, listen, you, you may have gone through the, the ceremony of circumcision, but the way that you're living shows that God does not have your heart. And so we could be going through all this motion, but until God says, wake up, and, and, and he says, listen, you're headed down a road of destruction, wake up. And we get that clear picture from our heavenly father and we go, wow, I just, I need to change some things. Last week we had the altar, probably more people at the altar than we've had in quite a while, you know? And people are saying, yes, I I want to give more of my life. I'm saying, I want to give more of my life to Jesus. I trust him. I want to, I want my desires to change. How do you do it? So a lot of times we make that decision, but then how do we do it? We have to have a strategy like my buddy did with the Diet Pepsi. We have to have a strategy. And the strategy for us is if I can't force my affections and my emotions, I know it's the right thing, so I'm going to meditate on the word of God. I'm going to be disciplined in my spiritual life. I'm going to make the right choices. And as I do that, I'm forming new habits and my desires are starting to change. You know, in Psalms, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know what I think we often live like? I'm going to delight in my desires. Man, I'm going to delight in these desires of mine, these idols in my life, these things that I put before God. And I'm going to say, God, you better give them to me. Like that's how we live in America. And somehow we've twisted theology to think that that's healthy when that's all backwards, when really we should be delighting in the Lord, choosing with our will and, and with our mind to delight in him. And as we delight in him, then then he actually transforms our desires. It's interesting how your desires change when you're delighting in him. So church, let us us be a church that is baptized in our heart, not just dunked in the tank. Because a dunk in the tank doesn't mean nothing unless you have a spiritual baptism of the heart where Christ is your all in all. And the only way he's your all in all is that you have repented of your sins. Just like what I said to Robin. Robin, do you know that Jesus died for your sin? Have you repented of your sin? Do you want to follow him? Do you want to follow him? She said, yes. Now we're not always going to be perfect with that. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to, we're going to make mistakes and and we're going to get drawn back to our other desires. But the Lord is got our heart. And, 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 he, and he is the one that does it. So church, just live in your new identity. Like I said at the beginning of this, of this sermon, this is an identity passage. It's an identity passage. Live out your identity. Now, he ends with this phrase, the spirit circumcises the heart. The spirit circumcises the heart. I worked on this a little bit to kind of, as I was wrapping my mind around this and studying this, and I, I want to, read from this, the, the, um, the sermon here, my sermon notes, because I don't want to get this wrong. This quote reminds us of the merging of flesh and spirit. Ever since the enlightenment, we have slowly drifted away from an appreciation and an awe and an embracing of the divine. The scriptures teaches us that we are made from the dust, physical, and from the breath of God. We are spiritual and we are physical. The physical ceremony of baptism, just like circumcision, bids us to bring our physicality into the divine world, to experience on a physical level the reality of the divine. Upon repentance, the spirit removes our sin and we are cleansed. We are cleansed. That is our identity. Upon repentance, the physical act of baptism represents the merging of the spirit with flesh to cleanse us in our physical bodies so that we may live alive to the spirit now in our physical bodies. Let me say that one more time, that quote one more time. I have that up for you there. Upon repentance, the spirit removes our sin and we are cleansed. 
The physical act of baptism just represents the merging of spirit with flesh. That's what it represents to cleanse us in our physical bodies, now in our life, so that we may be alive to the spirit in our bodies. Just as we are to work our salvation out, it is an ongoing surrender of the mind, will, and affections, church. We are to live this out, live out our identity, this heart that is fully given over to the Lord because of what he has done for us. So just live it out, church. We, we want to surrender all of it to our Lord for him to fully sanctify This week, let me ask you this. I'm going to end with this. This week, how can you cut off some of the excess things in life that compete for your mind, affections, and will? How can you cut those things off? Cut those things off. It's a circumcision of the heart. And let him have all of you. (laughs) Professor at Moody for my spiritual disciplines class, you know, really when it comes to the mind and the heart, the mind and the, 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 the will, it's disciplining yourself spiritually. We are so lazy spiritually often. Thank God we have a Lord who never gives up on us. But he said, he said this to us. He said, you guys, if you don't discipline yourself spiritually, if you don't model what Jesus, like follow Jesus's model where he went and, prayed constantly and you're spending time in prayer and you're spending time in the word and you're worshiping with his church, if you're not engaging with that, he said, Satan's going to eat you for lunch. Like you said, like he roars around, he walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he would devour. And so he's going to, he's going to take and steal your joy and make you live a defeated life. But if you give over those things to the Lord, then he will help you live a victorious Christian life. Let us pray. Father, I pray that as we study this text, Lord, that that you would do your work, Lord, that those, those who even came forward last week, myself included, Lord, to just say, we need to let go of some things in our life, Lord, that you would help us with our mind and our affections, and our will, or that you would transform our heart, you would circumcise our heart and separate us from those things that would take your place. We want to put you first. And we thank you that you love us and that you never give up on us. In your name, amen.